Hello everyone, in today's video I'll be showing you how I spent two weeks in Japan. From late night street food in Fukuoka, to a 343 year old restaurant in Yanagawa, Japan's best pork in Kagoshima, Japan's largest Chinatown in Yokohama. Finally I end the trip with a two Michelin star tempura dinner in Tokyo. This is how I spent 14 days in Japan. Day 1. I started my trip to Japan in Narita Airport just outside Tokyo, however, unlike most people, I was not starting my trip in Tokyo. Instead, I was heading to Fukuoka. I was taking Peach Airlines, and this would be my first time taking a budget carrier in Japan, so I was pretty nervous. Instead of a normal gate, there's these two glass doors leading out to a bus stop. Somehow an entire plane full of people was packed into two buses and it really felt like we were shoulder to shoulder and it was so hot and stuffy inside the bus. Eventually we made it to the plane waiting for us on the tarmac and it was so loud and it smelled like gasoline outside. On board the plane I had to squeeze into the seats and I'm only 5'3". This was definitely the smallest airplane seat and the least amount of legroom I've ever had on a flight. To make matters worse, we departed 30 minutes late. At least the ground crew waved to us as we set off, which is the tradition in Japan. Moments later, we took off. I was treated to a panoramic night view of Tokyo. If you look close, you can even see Tokyo Tower. Two hours later, just as I was about to fall asleep, the city of Fukuoka came into view. From the airport, I hopped in a taxi and then I dropped my bags off at the hotel. At this point I was starving since I hadn't eaten in hours and it was already 11pm so I headed to Yatai. Yatai are street food stalls that are famous in Fukuoka and they're known for staying open really late at night. Surprisingly some of the Yatai had already closed for the night but thankfully I found this Yatai specializing in ramen. I got myself a bowl of Hakata style ramen which is characterized by its thin noodles as well as a plate full of gyoza which is popular in Fukuoka. A piping hot bowl of ramen was just what I needed after a long and tiring day of travel. After dinner I trudged back to the hotel and I was so exhausted so I fell asleep immediately. Day 2. This was my first full day so I was excited to get the trip started. First things first I had to get some breakfast and I was looking forward to it because I heard the breakfast at the Solaria Nishi Tetsu which is the hotel I was staying at was pretty good. They had such a variety of food, everything from sushi, to tonkatsu, to western options like sausage, they even had a salad bar as well. I started my meal off with some sashimi, which you can never go wrong with. I also had some salad, and seriously, Japanese hotel have some of the freshest and crispest lettuce you'll ever taste. Some other highlights included their thick cut juicy bacon, and their french toast and coconut sauce which was so decadent and delicious and I had to get it every single day. After breakfast, I loaded my Suica card, which is my transit card, onto my phone via Apple Wallet. Then I walked over to the nearest bus stop and took the bus since Fukuoka unfortunately does not have the best subway system. 20 minutes later, I made it to Fukuoka Tower. From the observation deck, you get beautiful views of the surrounding area and it seems like every Japanese city has at least one tall tower. They also have an area where you can buy and hang up your own love locks. On my way out, I saw Fukuoka Tower's mascot and it really seems like the Japanese have a mascot for literally everything. Then I hopped in a taxi and headed off to lunch at a very unusual restaurant. I stopped by Hakata Toyoichi, which is a specialty seafood restaurant, and my gosh, it was packed. There was literally a 30 minute wait. Placing my order was really difficult since you have to order on a tablet and I cannot read Japanese. I ordered various types of live shellfish and they brought them out on a grill. The abalone was literally still moving. 
The abalone was sweet and tender, and clearly it was no surprise as it was so fresh. The main thing that this place was known for, however, is their 70 cent sushi. Yes, you heard that right, each piece of sushi is only 70 cents. The value of this was just unmatched since they served thick slices of fish on top of the rice. On top of that, they were using high quality fresh ingredients like Kyushu salmon. After lunch, once again I hopped in another taxi. I stopped by Daimyo Soft Cream, which serves soft serve ice cream, which is one of my favorite Japanese treats. The milk soft cream was milky and smooth with a luscious texture, however it wasn't quite as good as the Hokkaido soft serve I had when I was in Hokkaido last year, and I was really missing that. Afterwards, I took a walk to Mitsukoshi, which is a luxury department store. After arriving at Mitsukoshi, I headed down to their basement immediately, which is full of food. They have freshly made bento boxes, high quality steak, strawberry and chocolate cookies which I bought later and are absolutely scrumptious, and finally my favorite, the luxury fruit section. These giant apples will set you back $5. How about $13 cherries? Or $40 mandarin oranges? They even have a $200 melon which I might try later on in the trip. I bought these $26 grapes which are the best grapes you'll ever try. Finally, I got these $6 Mekon oranges. Then I was off to dinner at Yaltai Mamichan, which is one of the most famous Yaltai stalls in Fukuoka. The sky was literally ninja and it was so fascinating to see him cook in the kitchen with his speed and efficiency and just masterful skill. I started with the mentaiko omelette which is an omelette filled with salted spicy codro and it actually tastes a lot better than it looks. It was so juicy, the eggs were cooked perfectly and the mentaiko turned it into a flavor bomb. I also got the grilled beef tongue, which he cooked with a mini flamethrower, and whenever someone brings out a blowtorch, you know it's gonna be good. It was really thick, slightly chewy, and had a unique crunchy and crusty shell, probably from the fire. <laughs> I ended the meal with fried rice and it had a rich umami flavor coating every single grain of rice. This was an incredible dinner that came with an even better show and it's something you must do when visiting Fukuoka. Then I headed back to the hotel to try some of the luxury grapes I bought earlier. Without a doubt these are the best grapes you'll ever eat in your entire life. They have a rich sweetness and such an intense and luxurious perfume like flavor. And just like that, my first full day in Japan had come to an end. Day 3 The next morning, I set off on a day trip to the city of Yanagawa, which is known as the Venice of Japan due to its many canals. I was excited since this would be my first time taking a train on this trip.
An hour later, I made it to Yanagawa Station, and from there I took a taxi off to lunch. This restaurant serves various types of seafood, however they are known for their Japanese mud skipper or alien fish, which is a local specialty. It is served as live sashimi, which is pretty wild. There were two varieties, a lighter fish and a darker fish. The lighter fish had a surprisingly subtle and gentle flavor. The darker fish had a much more irony and bloody taste, almost like a rare steak, and the texture was really unique. It was slightly crunchy, yet spongy all at the same time. From lunch, I took a taxi to the punting boat station to take a ride on one of their traditional boats through the many canals. Thankfully, I was able to pick up one of these traditional bamboo hats for 100 yen since it was a flaming hot day outside. Then it was time to enjoy my boat ride. Halfway through the ride, we pulled up to a riverside ice cream stand. For 400 yen, I had myself some strawberry soft serve, which was sweet, slightly tart, with a rich strawberry flavor, and it was just what I needed to cool down. Moments later, we were back on our way down the canal. <laughs> Throughout the ride, our captain also sang many traditional songs. At the end, he sent us off with one final song. <laughs> Then I took the free shuttle bus offered by the boat company back to Yanagawa Station before heading off to dinner. Dinner was at a 343 year old restaurant specializing in unagi eel. I was really looking forward to my meal since they've held their eel and sauce recipe secret since 1681. I enjoyed a coarse meal full of small dishes, however the star of the show was their legendary eel box. There were thick slices of eel over the top of rice, covered in a slightly sweet and savory sauce that really enhanced the natural flavor of the eel. I could also taste the crispy exterior of the eel, which was just charred and absorbed all the flavor from the charcoal grill. This was such a hearty and heavy meal, so I had to roll myself back to the train station, and the longer I walked, the more I fell into a food coma. Eventually, I made it back to the hotel, and then I just crashed. Day 4. The next day, the first thing I had to do was pick up train tickets at Hakata Station, since I would be taking the bullet train in a couple of days.
Eventually, I picked up my tickets for when I would head to Kagoshima in a couple of days. And then I was off to lunch. I enjoyed an authentic bowl of Hakata-style ramen at an old-school shop that's been around for a number of years. The broth had a rich, porky taste like it had been cooked for hours, yet it wasn't overly rich, and there was so much collagen in there, it just coated your lips and left them feeling a little sticky. There were also paper-thin slices of chashu pork, which I appreciated, that way it didn't get weighed down a ton. They used freshly made ramen noodles, which had a really soft and tender texture, and were unlike anything I had before. Unfortunately, I rushed back to the hotel to change after having a mishap with the ramen. After that minor setback, I was off to get some dessert. I decided to visit a popular confection shop, which maybe wasn't the brightest idea since it was a Saturday and I had to wait 60 minutes in order to get seated. I got a matcha parfait filled with matcha ice cream, red beans, mochi balls, and fruit. And maybe it was worth the wait after all since it was quite tasty and refreshing. Then I started walking towards the famous Canal City Mall. Before heading to Canal City, I decided to check out Kushida Shrine, which is right across the street. After relaxing for a bit at Kushida Shrine, I walked back across the street to Canal City to see their famous water show. After the show, I took a walk to dinner at a restaurant where the chef lights Kagoshima chicken on fire using his magical chicken oil. I had everything from chicken thigh, to breast, neck, skin, and even boneless chicken wings. The chicken absorbed all the smoke from its bath in the fire, and it also had an extra bit of flavor from all the chicken oil that was used to cook it. I also loved talking to the owner, who had such a fun personality. I really appreciated him letting me film inside the kitchen, since no one has ever let me do that before. Through his cooking and his jovial personality, I can really see his passion for what he does. With a full belly and in high spirits, I headed back to the hotel. Just like that, another night in Fukuoka was done. Day 5. It was another bright and sunny day in Fukuoka, and I decided to head to Ahori Park right after breakfast, which is one of the largest and most popular parks in Fukuoka. First off, I took a walk across their large lake.
Afterwards, I stopped at the park cafe for a cold glass of Yame green tea, which is famous in Fukuoka. It had a unique sweetness to it, and I could definitely tell it was high quality tea. After resting up for a few minutes, I headed off to their Japanese garden that is inside of the park. After strolling through the tranquil gardens, I once again caught another taxi off to lunch. It started like any other taxi ride until the driver saw a little side street. He said, ah, shortcut, and then cackled like a madman. Actually, a side street might be an exaggeration, it was more like an alleyway. As soon as he turned around one corner, he all of a sudden hit the gas pedal like someone was chasing after him. And there we were, racing at breakneck speeds, and when I saw some pedestrians up ahead, I thought he might slow it down, but not in the slightest, he just kept on plowing through. Moments later, he was forced to crawl by a cluster of pedestrians blocking his path. By a stroke of sheer luck, I made it to my destination in one piece. For lunch, I went to the shopping center beneath my hotel, to a gyoza chain that the hotel concierge had recommended to me. I had boiled gyoza, which were juicy bites of porky goodness. Next, I had fried gyoza, which were just crispy bites of pure deliciousness. I mean, just look at that tantalizingly thin dumpling skirt. Editing this video right now is just making me really hungry. As if I didn't have enough food already, I demolished a sizable bowl of golden brown fried rice. To burn off some of the calories, I took a walk around the Iwataya department store across the street. Next, I walked to a popular kakigori shop that I found on Google, and boy, was that one of the best decisions I could have made. Kakigori is Japanese shaved ice, and it's probably my favorite summer dessert. I got this strawberry kakigori made with Fukuoka of Mo strawberries, which are some of Japan's best strawberries. It is topped with whipped cream that has been shipped from the factory in under 2 hours, and I didn't even know that was possible. Without a doubt, this is the best shaved ice I've ever had in my entire life, and I think the ingredients speak for themselves. They are also really generous, and they give you even more strawberry sauce to add on top. Afterwards, I took a walk through the underground Tenjin shopping streets. The ceiling had a fascinating design, it was just like a metal lattice cover that was really intricate. Then I rested up at the hotel before dinner. For dinner, I had reservations at a restaurant specializing in motsunabe, which is Japanese beef intestine hot pot. Now I know what you're thinking, you're probably like, ugh, beef intestines, how good could it really be? Well, in my honest opinion, it is so delicious. It's like a thin, chewy strip of meat, and just attached to it is a big, huge cube of buttery, rich beef fat. Going along with that, you toss in a huge plate of vegetables and tofu, and everything all together just absorbs the rich, heavy, salty miso broth. To end the meal, I tossed some champo noodles into the broth and boiled them until they were perfectly chewy, and this is how the locals like to finish their motsunabe. The noodles just sopped up the oil slick on top of the broth from all the beef intestine cooking, and it was definitely a heavy end to a giant hot pot meal. Dazed and in a heavy food coma, I stumbled back to the hotel after a day of overeating. Day 6. This was my last day in Fukuoka. The first thing I did was head over to Uniqlo to do a bit of shopping in the morning. Then I walked back to the same Iwataya department store I was at the day before to have some lunch.
I stopped by Tatsumi Sushi, which is a popular Fukuoka sushi chain that had a shop inside the Iwataya department store. I ordered a set that came with soup, salad, and egg custard. Of course, the set came with many various types of sushi. There was squid, this one with hot peppers on it, inari, and of course tuna. This was definitely higher end sushi since it was already seasoned with wasabi and sauce, which was really nice since it was easy to eat. All of the sushi was expertly made and did not disappoint. After lunch, I headed off to 308 year old tea house. It was intriguing to have tea in this traditional building. I enjoyed a hot cup of their coveted Yame Matcha tea. It was extremely thick because of all the matcha powder they used, and on top, it was light and frothy. The tea also had an unparalleled depth of flavor. You could really taste all the sweetness and umami fragrance. Because the tea was unsweetened, it came with a side of candied sweet potatoes, which had a delightful sugary crust. There was also a green tea financier which had such an aromatic and light sweet flavor and was gone in just a few precious bites. I couldn't leave empty handed so I bought a massive amount of tea and then I was off again. Call me crazy but I headed back to my favorite kakigori shop. The kakigori I ordered was made with milk from Aso in Kumamoto Prefecture, which has the best milk in all of Kyushu. Because they used shaved milk instead of regular ice, it gave it a unique, almost ice cream-like flavor. After making a pit stop at the hotel, it was off to dinner in the rain. <laughs> I went to a higher end yakitori restaurant and I got a massive amount of grilled chicken skewers and it's safe to say that I over ordered. I got tail, heart, gizzard, thigh and green onion, and a chicken lantern whatever the heck that is. I ordered even more skewers off camera and it's safe to say by the end of the meal I was pretty tired of chicken. That night I tried to get to bed ASAP since the next morning I'd be leaving to Kagoshima. Day 7 after breakfast, I checked out and headed off to Hakata Station. From there, it would be a one hour ride on the Shinkansen to Kagoshima. After arriving at Kagoshima Chuo Station, I hopped on a free shuttle bus offered by my hotel, which was the Shiroyama.
After arriving, I enjoyed lunch at one of their 9 restaurants, which is a pretty insane thing to say. I ordered a set lunch that came with seaweed salad, which had a beautiful earthy flavor. It was followed by the best salad I had on the entire trip. All the lettuce was crisp and fresh and just had a perfect crunch to it. And then on top of that, you had a delicious tangy sesame and ginger dressing that was literally to die for. I also got some more chawamushi, which is a jiggly, savory egg custard, and this one was filled with mushrooms. Then they brought out a platter of sushi, which was just like a rainbow of colors. There was uni, salmon, crab, squid, a mysterious whitefish, sea bream, tamago, unagi, and of course tuna. This was the best sushi I had on an entire trip. This was some of the freshest fish I've ever eaten in my entire life and the rice was also perfectly seasoned and just had the right amount of texture. Bite after bite after bite of sushi I took and each one just kept getting better. You really haven't had sushi until you've had something of this caliber. I mean this sushi is just on a whole nother playing field. For dessert, I had a luscious chocolate pudding that was a sweet ending to a satisfying lunch. After lunch, I stopped by the hotel bakery, which is insane because how many hotels have a bakery? I couldn't resist picking up a couple of treats for the room. At this hotel, they even have a fancy cafe and I always saw plenty of people in there. Right behind the hotel, you have breathtaking views of Sakurajima, which is a giant active volcano overlooking the city of Kagoshima. After exploring the hotel grounds, it was clear to me that this was a 5 star resort. Then I checked into my room. To the right of the front door, you have a large mirror and then beneath it you have two types of slippers. The first one is your room slippers and then they also give you pairs of slippers to wear to the hotel onsen which is a hot spring bath. The room is also stocked with coffee, tea, cups, and an electric kettle. This is the bathroom which comes with a marble countertop and two sinks, and just off to the side, they also have the bathroom amenities. Just down the hallway, you have the main part of the room. There's not two, but four beds in total, so it's very spacious and roomy. The best part of the room is the view, since you can see the city of Kagoshima and the active volcano that overlooks Kagoshima, Sakurajima. Then it was almost time for dinner, which I was literally looking forward to since I would be trying Kurobuta black pork. This is known as Japan's best pork due to the high quality texture and flavor of the meat. It's said to taste four times more flavorful than your typical pork because these pigs are raised on a special high quality diet. I could not contain myself any longer so I was off to try Kurobuta pork in its tonkatsu form. Once again I got another large set meal, but who cares about that, let's skip to the pork. Their black tonkatsu is made with a thick cutlet of Kurobuta pork sirloin and then it's coated in their charcoal breading since they use charcoal to dye it a deep rich black color. The second you bite into it, you get a really thick and crunchy outer crust that just tastes like it's made with fresh bread and the second it touches your tongue, it just sort of dissipates. The pork itself is just bursting with juices and just floods your mouth as you chew it and it also does have so much intense flavor, it really does taste twice as flavorful as your regular Japanese pork. They also give you some miso sauce on the side to dip your pork into and it really is a must. The sauce brings out the natural sweetness of the pork which is almost unimaginable so one day you will have to try it for yourself. 
The best thing about the pork is there is virtually no trace of oil on the outside of the batter at all, so it wasn't heavy at all, and I did not feel weighed down as I finished the rest of my large course meal. Once again, this was the best tonkatsu I've ever had in my entire life, and I think it might be worth going to Kagoshima just to try it. For whatever reason, when I arrived back at the hotel room, I still had room to try a couple of treats I picked up at the bakery earlier. I started with their famous apple pie. It was stuffed with golden juicy sweet apples, and the crust was more of like a croissant than a traditional pie crust, so I could see why this is their top item at the bakery. Then I tucked into a pudding, which is quite possibly one of the best Japanese desserts. The pudding was so smooth and velvety, it had a rich, eggy flavor, and it was sprinkled with vanilla beans, which really made it such a pleasant eating experience. I ended the night at their natural hot spring bath before heading to bed. Day 8 The next morning I headed down to breakfast, since the Shiroyama has the highest rated hotel breakfast in Kyushu. They have over 80 different breakfast items, so I got everything from freshly made omelets, to a flambéed French toast, grilled fish, freshly baked pastries, and more. There was also a massive amount of servers. This definitely reminded me of Squid Games. After finishing up, I think it was safe to say that this is the best hotel breakfast in Kyushu, and it lives up to all the hype, as it's really something to behold. From the hotel, I took the City View bus to Kagoshima's most popular attraction. I stepped foot in the serene Sangha and Gardens, so I took a moment to explore. Since it was a hot day, I stopped at their cafe for some kakagori. Although it wasn't as good as that strawberry kakagori in Fukuoka, it still did the job. Next, it was off to late lunch.
I made it to a popular conveyor belt sushi shop and then I had to wait half an hour before getting seated. I got a variety of sushi off the conveyor belt and it was surprisingly high quality especially since conveyor belt sushi tends to be on affordable side and affordable this sushi was. I got these 15 plates of sushi for only $40. Then I took a walk through downtown Kagoshima to burn off some of the calories. I arrived back at the hotel only to see Sakurajima erupting. Apparently eruptions are just a part of daily life in Kagoshima and people are pretty accustomed to it. Then I left for dinner to get Kurobuta pork hot pot. I couldn't help myself and I got another course meal and I mean it came with way, way too many sides. Let's cut to the chase which is the shabu shabu hot pot and this was my second most favorite meal of the whole trip. There was a platter of fatty kurobuta pork slices fanned out in the ornate pattern. To cook, all you had to do was swish it around in a pot of boiling water. They said I could eat it rare but I decided to not risk it since I had a flight leaving to Tokyo the next day. This was hands down the best pork I've ever eaten in my entire life and I can see why many people compare it to Japanese Wagyu beef. The second the meat touched my tongue it just vanished and it had such a sweet flavor I thought the pig was fed a diet of solely sugar and sweets. To flavor it I just dipped it in a light broth with green onions because that's all it needs. This was such an extraordinary cut of meat, so extraordinary that I might have to go back to Kagoshima just to relive that experience. Perhaps the most remarkable thing is the price of the meal as it was only $26 and this was a feast fit for a king. Then I headed back to my human sized hot pot back at the hotel and it was off to sleep. Day 9. After breakfast I headed off on my journey to Tokyo. The day I left the hotel was the first day of a large rainstorm so I was really lucky to avoid all the rain when I was in Kagoshima. After arriving at Kagoshima Station, I boarded my bullet train bound for Fukuoka as I was leaving out of Fukuoka Airport. And yes, there is more train footage incoming since I never get tired of the bullet train. After exiting Hakata Station, I caught a taxi to the airport. After dropping off my bags, I found a set meal restaurant for lunch. I got this set lunch, which came with stewed vegetables, sashimi, and stewed fish heads. The vegetables were juicy and flavorful, and the sashimi was surprisingly fresh. You're probably thinking that those stewed fish heads couldn't possibly be good. However, that is actually far from the truth. The head has some of the most fatty and flavorful meat on the entire fish and on top of that it's just soaking in a really dark soy sauce which has so much strong and earthy flavor that goes perfectly with the rice they give you on the side. Japanese airport food is so underrated it really just tastes like food from a local restaurant so if you ever find yourself at the airport in Japan you must have at least one meal there. Afterwards, I boarded my Japan Airlines flight bound for Haneda, which is Japan's highest rated airport. This was so much more comfortable than my Peach flight, and some might say it's miles better. Airplane puns aside, there was a reasonable amount of legroom, and the seat had a pretty nice recline, plus there was even a screen. I took off from Fukuoka with rain streaming down the windows, and then eventually we broke through the clouds. 
Halfway through the flight, we were also served drinks, and I just got myself hot green tea. Just before landing, I was treated to beautiful views of the majestic Mount Fuji, which is a rare view since it is often hidden behind clouds or fog. On our final approach, we passed over the center of Tokyo and I got sweeping views of the city. Moments later, I touched down and then I rushed off the plane as I was excited to explore Japan's highest rated airport. For dinner, I stopped by Godaime Hanayama Udon, which is one of the most popular udon shops in all of Tokyo, and I'm surprised that they have a branch at the airport since they make their noodles fresh even at the airport location. They went viral for their flat udon noodles, so I got their cold flat udon noodles topped with beef and a soft boiled egg. This udon is a thousand times better than anything you get outside of Japan. The fresh, cold noodles make all the difference because you really get a fresh, soft chewiness to them. And then on top of that, you have the fatty slices of beef and the creamy egg yolk. After dinner, I walked around the airport for a bit. There was this one restaurant specializing in all-you-can-eat Kobe Wagyu beef, which I thought was pretty crazy for an airport since it was such an expensive and fancy place. There's also even an entire hotel stuffed inside the airport somehow. Then it was time to take the Tokyo monorail to my accommodation for the next few nights, which was the Strings Hotel. had a solid hotel room, however it was a bit on the small side, which is quite common for Tokyo, but as you'll see later on the trip, it's not always the case. My favorite thing had to be the view from the room. Exhausted after a long day of travel, I immediately went to sleep. Day 10. This was my first day in Tokyo, so I was excited to explore, but first breakfast. While the breakfast buffet looked appetizing, unfortunately, this was the worst food I had on my entire trip. For starters, their grilled salmon was horrible. It was so dry and it was like biting into a hard rock. There was also watery miso soup and flavorless mush called French toast. It is safe to say I was sorely disappointed by this hotel breakfast. A much better option is the Gate Hotel which I stayed at last year as it's around the same price. The location is slightly better since it's more centrally located in Tokyo and the rooms are fairly comparable. The biggest difference is the Gate Hotel's breakfast is on a whole nother level. It is so much better and more luxurious. They have freshly baked bread, imported butter from France, a giant slab of fresh honeycomb and a proper French toast that is sandwiched with two slices of bacon and was oh so scrumptious. I know I just got sidetracked, but after my disappointing breakfast, it was off to Shinjuku.
Because it was raining, I decided to check out Takashimaya, which is a giant department store. For lunch, I stopped by a soba restaurant on the top floor of the department store. I ordered a steaming bowl of the smoked duck soba, which is my favorite type of Japanese soba. There was a light broth with such a rich and smoky flavor from all the duck meat in there, and then the duck itself was thickly cut with just a sliver of fat on top, making it all the more indulgent and tasty. The soba noodles were made with hand-milled buckwheat, so they had a really pleasant, chewy, and tender texture, and this hot bowl of soba was the perfect thing on a rainy day. After lunch, I headed back to the hotel, and I tried a couple of treats that I picked up at the department store. I started off with a muscat grape covered in mochi. The mochi was such a thin and soft, delicate layer surrounding a crisp, fresh, juicy muscat grape, and I just love the natural fragrance and aroma of the grape. I also had to try to see makawayaki, which I saw them making earlier at the department store. It's basically like two pancakes cooked on a griddle, and then it's filled with red bean paste. It was just like two thick, fluffy pancakes, almost as if they were a cake, and then the inner red bean filling was smooth with large pieces of red beans in there as well. Probably the best thing about this dessert is it was really light and it wasn't overly sweet. Around an hour later, the rain finally passed and it was time to head off to dinner. I found a restaurant in the back streets of Akihabara, which is a neighborhood I had never explored before, and this restaurant specialized in monkfish, which is a deep sea fish that looks really scary. Despite that, I was really excited since monkfish is a really rare and treasured delicacy in Japan. And by now, if you've been paying attention, you already know I had to get another course meal. I started off with a little bit of sashimi. This was a little piece of mackerel with a little bit of lemon, and it was simple and delicious as always. Then for the first monkfish dish, which was a monkfish jello made with the bones and skin. This was so fun to eat because of its jiggly texture, and the flavor was quite mild since the fish didn't have a ton of flavor, and it just tasted kind of like a soy jelly. Then they brought out the main course, which is a monkfish hot pot filled with monkfish meat, skin, vegetables, and tofu. The texture and flavor of the monkfish meat was exquisite. It was almost like a cross between scallop, crab, and lobster. The meat just had a slight chewy texture and was just bursting with seafood sweetness. The liver was even better as it's the most valuable and popular part of fish to eat. It was bright orange and had a delicate texture like silk and tofu. The flavor was reminiscent of mackerel and it was really fatty and oily and had so much flavor. After I finished the hot pot, the broth remained and to it they added some fresh rice, turning it into a luxury rice porridge. The rice just absorbed all the flavor of the broth which had a really deep soy flavor and you could also taste all the vegetables and the fish as well, however it just took all the natural sweetness from the fish, there was no fishiness to it at all. It was also topped off with green onions for a fresh crunch. After dinner I took one last look at the sea monster I had just devoured and then I walked back through the heart of Akihabara back to the station. And that was my first full day in Tokyo. Day 11. The next day I headed off to Yokohama to meet up with my friend who lives there, and it's only 30 minutes away by train.
My friend Sayo took me to Yokohama's Chinatown, which is the largest Chinatown in Japan. First, we stopped by the shop specializing in soup dumplings. While they're delicious, you do have to eat them really slowly and carefully, or else you might explode scalding hot soup all over. Despite the messiness and danger level, I still recommend trying them when visiting Chinatown. Next, Sayo took me to a stand selling her favorite dessert in Chinatown, which is candy-coated fruit. This skewer I tried was grapes and strawberries covered in a thick sugar shell. There's something to be said for a simple treat like this that hits the spot. You have juicy fruit covered in a thick, crunchy sugar shell, and it's really sweet and satisfying. For lunch, we eventually found a restaurant with no wait, so maybe don't go on a weekend like we did since Chinatown was packed with tourists. I started with one of my favorites, which is the barbecue pork rice roll. It's like a rice noodle wrapper filled with sweet, caramelized, sticky barbecue pork. And another Chinese classic, which is the chashu pork served over rice. And this was a lot sweeter than the chashu I'm typically used to, but I definitely enjoyed it still. I also had some crispy gyoza dumplings, which were delicious as well. On top of all the food I already had, I got some fried rice. And let's be honest, you can't ever go wrong with fried rice. Finally, I had these sweet buns filled with egg custard center. They had a really cute design, and it was a great way to round off a delicious meal. After lunch, we took a short walk to Yamashita Park to take in scenic views of Yokohama Bay. From Yamashita Park, we walked over to Yokohama's historic red brick warehouses, which are filled with shops and eateries. Then Sayo treated us to a ride on the Yokohama Air Cabin, which takes you across the water. This was her first time on the Air Cabin, so it was cool to experience it together. As it was a hot day after the air cabin, we stopped at a fruit parlor for a cold treat. I went for this fancy melon parfait to use high quality, aromatic, and sweet Japanese melon, and there was also a couple scoops of ice cream and sorbet. After 8 hours in Yokohama, I went back to Yokohama Station, and then I headed back to Tokyo for dinner. I was craving sushi, so I decided to go to Sushi Zanmai, which is one of the most popular sushi chains in Japan. I stopped by the original location, which is open 24 hours a day, and even at 10pm, it was packed. I got a variety of sushi, but I mostly got every single type of tuna in existence, since tuna is their specialty, and it did not let me down. Back at the hotel, I dove into a couple of fruit sandwiches I picked up at the train station on my way back from Yokohama. The first one I had was strawberries and whipped cream, sandwiched between two slices of Japanese milk bread. The bread was light and airy, and then in between it, there was a dense whipped cream which had so much rich dairy flavor, and then juicy sweet strawberries. The next sandwich I had was whipped cream with the famous white Okayama peaches. The peaches had that iconic Japanese white peach flavor, they had such a rich and juicy texture. If you're in Japan, you gotta get your hands on some fruit sandwiches since they're totally underrated. Finally, after a long day of walking around and exploring Yokohama for hours, the day had come to an end. Day 12. The next morning, I checked out the strings and I hopped in a taxi and then I headed over to the Conrad, which was my next hotel, and I just dropped my bags off there. From there, it was just a short walk through the underground passage to the train station. At the train station, they had a robot station master, and this is seriously something you will only see in Japan. Then it was off to what is arguably Tokyo's most popular attraction, the iconic Shibuya Scramble Crossing.
For lunch, I went to this really unique restaurant inside the Shibuya Hikari shopping mall. This is DD47 Shokudo, a restaurant specializing in regional Japanese food from Japan's 47 different prefectures. At the restaurant, they have a connecting shop that sells regional specialty ingredients. Across the way from the restaurant, they have the museum that showcases ingredients from Japan's 47 different prefectures. There is a rotating menu every month showcasing a couple of different prefectures. I started off with the mackerel from Nagasaki Prefecture. The fish had a nice crunch to it because you had a really thick shell from all the deep fried panko breadcrumbs on the outside and the fish itself was supremely fatty and flavorful. I also got a coarse meal that used ingredients from northern Japan. It came with a vegetable soup which was light and really easy to drink. There was also this mixture of carrots and mushrooms marinated in a deep soy sauce. The main dish was this salt grilled pork chop that was very lean and juicy with also a thick layer of fat on top. This was a lot different than most Japanese food I've had before. Every dish really highlighted the freshness of the ingredients without having an overly dominating flavor or sauce. The best way I could describe this is it really reminded me of a hearty home cooked meal. After lunch I headed back to Shibuya Station and from there I headed to Harajuku as I was going to a viral cafe. This is Cafe Rishu, which has become world famous for their 3D latte art. I had their vanilla latte with a Totoro milk foam design on top. As far as taste went, it was just a typical latte. It was very milky and a bit on the sweet side for me. The real reason to go is for the elaborate designs. Just look at that jiggle. I mean, how could you resist such a cute design? Then it was finally time for me to check into my hotel, which was the Conrad, and boy, if I only knew what surprise was awaiting me. Somehow at check-in I was upgraded to a massive suite and I couldn't believe my eyes. Now if you're interested in seeing the full tour of this suite, make sure to check out my playlist in the description down below where you can see the full videos for every single day of this trip. After exploring my beautiful hotel suite, I headed off to dinner at Japan's largest yakitori chain. Torikizoku is famous for their extremely affordable yakitori skewers. Ordering is super easy since all you have to do is use a tablet. Some of my favorite skewers include the chicken hearts, gizzard, and meatballs. Just be sure that you have plenty to drink since these chicken skewers can get really salty after eating a few. While these may not be the best yakitori skewers, they'll still curb your craving and the price is unbeatable. You can easily get a massive amount of chicken skewers and drinks for $12 or less. That night I took in the beautiful skyline view of Tokyo Bay before heading to bed. Day 13. The next morning I woke up to a beautiful view of the city skyline and the Hamariku Gardens before heading down to breakfast. Their breakfast was a huge step up from the strings and did not let me down. They had options such as soba, 
pickled Japanese greens, thinly sliced bacon, and more. My favorites included the miso cod and the raspberry leafy smoothie, both of which were expertly crafted and used high-quality ingredients. One a la carte dish also comes with your breakfast, and the waitress recommended the mango cranberry pancakes, so I had to try it out. I'm so glad because no exaggeration, these are some of, if not the best pancakes I've ever had in my entire life. Biting into the pancakes is just like taking a bite out of a warm cloud, and then it's topped off with fresh, juicy, sweet mangoes and a tangy mango sauce. And finally, you have a dollop of creme brulee on top, making this my favorite part of the meal. After breakfast, I was off to Sakasa, which is one of my favorite areas of Tokyo. A popular thing to do in Asakusa is try street food, so I stopped off at this place that is famous for their menchi katsu, which is a meat patty that is filled with onions and then is deep fried. While it was quite rich, it was still so tasty it was worth the calories. Then I decided to head off for an early lunch of ramen. I was so excited because I found this ramen shop that is known for its $2.38 ramen, which is going to be some of Tokyo's cheapest ramen. To order, you use a vending machine. All you have to do is insert your money, click the menu item you want, and then the machine spits out a ticket which you hand to the chef. The broth was quite light and flavorful since they use a shoyu broth instead of the typical tonkatsu. The noodles were fresh and had a springy texture as they should. I was shocked by the quality of this ramen since it was just as good as a bowl that could cost 3 to 4 times as much. After finishing up, I headed off to get some dessert. I stopped by the shop tucked away in the alley to try their famous matcha tiramisu crepe. There's a paper thin matcha crepe just holding together the center which is a mixture of matcha cream and mascarpone and is topped off with even more matcha powder. This is perfect for a matcha obsessed person like myself. After devouring up that scrumptious crepe, I headed off to get one more sweet treat. I visited a sweet potato dessert shop and I got their most popular item on the menu which is a roasted sweet potato filled with creme brulee. Just look at that beauty. Creme brulee has got to be one of the most satisfying foods. Just look at that cracked top. The creme brulee was definitely on a thinner side and was more of like a sauce. However, it still had a really rich, achy flavor and I loved the crispy and crunchy sugar on top which added a slight bitterness from the char. The sweet potato on its own was ridiculously sweet as well, since it was roasted for hours, which gave it a really chewy, sticky, and caramel-like texture. Afterwards, I stopped by the famous Don Quixote, which is the giant Japanese superstore, and it was just around the block, since I needed to pick up a suitcase. The reason I got an entire suitcase is because when I was in Japan, I got so many different souvenirs, and I needed to bring them all home. After dropping my suitcase off at the hotel, I was heading to dinner in Tsukushima, which is this little man-made island that is only a few stops on the subway away from the Conrad.
Dinner was at a restaurant off of the famous Monja Street, which specializes in Monjiyaki, which is a unique Tokyo food. But before that, I started off with an appetizer of grilled squid, and what makes this restaurant really special is they have a teppanyaki grill right at your table, so they cook all your food right in front of you. As they were grilling the squid, they broke open the innards and mixed that in, which I did not expect them to do. However, they did add butter and soy sauce, and doesn't butter and soy sauce make everything taste better? The answer is yes, butter and soy sauce just gave it a rich, earthy umami flavor, and you would not know that you were eating squid mixed with its innards. Then it was finally time for them to make the monjiyaki. I ordered the squid ink monjiyaki, which came with a variety of vegetables, squid, and a whole bunch of dark black squid ink. In short, monjiyaki is basically like a thin pancake batter that is mixed with various types of meat and vegetables, and then it's just slowly cooked down on a griddle, longer and longer, until it turns into a sort of paste. I know at this point it really doesn't look too appetizing, and it looks like a pool of bubbling black tar, but the smell coming off of the grill was just insanely good. It literally tasted a thousand times better than it looked. The texture of the batter was almost like a luscious and rich Thanksgiving gravy, and then it was filled with little crunchy pieces of cabbage and slightly chewy pieces of squid. This is my favorite type of meal where the food is just cooked in front of you fresh, so I think when you're in Tokyo, monjiaki is something you definitely have to try. And just like that, my two-week trip had almost come to an end. Day 14. This was my final full day in Japan. At breakfast, I decided to try the lobster omelette this time since I heard people rave about it on Google reviews. While it wasn't as tasty as the pancakes I had the previous day, it was still very solid. It was a well-cooked omelette, and I loved the large pieces of lobster on top. After breakfast, I headed off to the famous Tokyo Skytree, which is the tallest tower in all of Japan. When I arrived at the Skytree to pick up my tickets, there was a 15 minute long line even though I got there right when it opened, so I'd say a pro tip is just to get there a few minutes early, but thankfully I didn't have to wait too long and then it was time to head to the top. This is the view from the Tempo deck, which is the lower observation deck, so yes, it is quite crowded and full of people, but you can still get some pretty decent views. Next, I headed up to the top deck, and this was a lot better since it was much less crowded. After taking in the highest views of Tokyo, I took the elevator back down a couple of stories. On this level, you can walk on top of a glass floor. Walking on the glass floor is quite sketchy, yet also fascinating all at the same time. Just be sure to tread lightly, or else... Ah! Oh no, you've just fallen from the third tallest freestanding tower in the entire world. For lunch, I stopped by this authentic Okinawan restaurant that is located in a shopping center underneath the Sky Tree. I got this huge set lunch filled with items that I've never seen or heard of before. First off, I had their soba, which was more like a ramen. There was a clear broth with thick ramen-like noodles and then a huge slab of pork belly. Next, I had a seaweed salad, which was slimy, tart, yet refreshing and tasty. Another wild item was the salted pork innards, which I was really scared for. These were shockingly tasty and had no organ flavor at all, it really just tasted like a mild pork stir-fry. Finally, the dish I was most excited about was a stir-fry with bitter melon as well as pork and eggs. 
This was easily my favorite dish. The bitter melon was unlike anything I had before. It was almost like a slightly bitter eggplant. And then with it, there's just fatty pieces of pork and just an almost mixture of scrambled eggs. After lunch, I couldn't help myself and I had to get more ice cream. I found this stand specializing in Uji Matcha, so I had their Uji Matcha soft serve and it definitely hit the spot since it had such a rich and intense matcha flavor. Then I headed back to the hotel to get changed, and then I was off to Tempura Kondo, which is a two Michelin star omakase tempura restaurant. If you haven't seen a full video yet, you definitely have to check it out because I tell the fascinating story of Tempura Kondo. But either way, eventually I headed over and I made it just outside Tempura Kondo. Immediately after being seated, I was served various different types of appetizers. Then it was finally time to try the coveted tempura freshly fried up by 77 year old chef Fumio Kondo. To launch off the tempura feast, I started with their scallop. It just had such a thin crispy batter and the scallop itself was so tender it just melted in your, in your mouth and it had just an immense sweet flavor. Another highlight was this white asparagus which is a staple in Michelin star restaurants. It was much more tender than your typical asparagus and it had a much more delicate and refined flavor compared to just green asparagus. This fish also knocked my socks off because of how juicy and sweet it was and just like all the other pieces of tempura I had, it wasn't greasy in the slightest. After another 10 large pieces of tempura or so, they brought out this little set that came with more tempura, rice, and miso soup. For dessert, they brought out this platter of muscat grapes and luxury melon. The muscat grapes were perfect as always, sweet which is a rich fragrance. The melon was easily the best I ever had due to its rich texture of juiciness, intense sweetness, and fine flavor. It was so satisfying to finally eat one of those expensive melons that had really been teasing me the whole trip just sitting there in all the department store windows. This was my favorite meal of the trip and an epic way to end off an incredible journey. That night before I went to sleep and left early the next morning, I took some time to reflect on my two-week adventure. This trip was full of travel, from racing through the Japanese countryside at supersonic speeds on the bullet train, to flying over Mount Fuji. Even though I spent hours of my trip traveling, it was worth it since I was able to experience the diversity of Japan. From the vibrant nightlife in Fukuoka and fire food. Literally fire food. To the peaceful and traditional canals of Yanagawa a luxury resort in Kagoshima, catching up with a good friend and exploring Japan's second largest city of Yokohama, and the sprawling metropolis and bustling city of Tokyo. This trip reinforced why I will never get tired of visiting Japan. You have everything from Japan's natural beauty to the rich culture and endless amounts of food. As always, the people I meet on my trips are the ones who make the experience all the more special. Everyone from the Yatai master who gave me recommendations on tourist attractions in Fukuoka, to the owner of the fire chicken shop who let me film inside the kitchen and then walked me out the door and thanked me repeatedly, the staff at the Shiroyama who provided the highest level of hospitality and sent me off with a present after I gave them a gift. So a special thank you to everyone I met along the way who made this an unforgettable journey across Japan. One day, just one day, I will be back to Japan. Anyways, I really hope you all enjoyed the Japan series and this movie length video. Make sure if you did to give it a like, and also make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.